Hello, everyone. Welcome to our last majlis, uh, last Monday majlis of, of this year. And uh, our guest uh, today is, is Kamran Talatov. And, uh, and uh, well, one of the, one of the forum, fora I used to, to advertise the, uh, this, uh, these, these majlis is, is the Adabiya, but I also actually see what's going on there. And uh, the way, way how this majlis came into being is that I saw uh, Kamran, um, uh, Kamran's new, uh, ad, uh, new book advertised. And then, then I thought that's that's fantastic. We are going to that's one of the one of the uh, goals of of the match list to discuss newly newly published books, and uh, and I thought that would be ideal. And then I approached Kamran, uh, and and we we f uh, found this state. Um, I you also know that that I'm trying to mix. Uh, this much less uh, to have people really from from various background and and very at, at various uh, um, level levels in their career, and I, I wanted I wanted to to conclude with with someone someone really established. So that's why we are concluding uh, with 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 Kamran, the the series for the year. And then I had I had the the joy to to meet him in Denver. Uh, a week ago or two weeks ago, I don't. And uh, and um, so so and and learned very interesting things about him, but he will probably share with you as well in 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 the introduction. So I will be silent, and and uh, Cameron will will take over. Thank you so very much, Suan, Sarah, for and the Majlis for inviting me. Um, <laughs> it's um, also I'm thankful for all of you who have um, uh, participated. Um, some of uh, you uh, doesn't surprise Dr. Jocelyn Charlotte. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I hadn't seen her for a while. Thank you, Marta from uh, Toronto. Um, my colleague Austin O'Malley from Arizona, and many, many, uh, many more. Um, uh, if uh, Stevan had asked me two months ago to talk about um, myself as part of the presentation is this uh, this forum, I would have respectfully turned down the invitation. I've never talked about my past uh, until Runner, Runner's World magazine, the largest in that sport, interviewed me um, last summer and published a September um, article uh, titled, He Keeps Running to Process His Past, uh, His uh, Painful Past. This piece touches upon my ultra marathon running, political trauma, and academic works. Its publication revealed a piece of my story, and consequently, I feel I can share some of my experience. But so you don't take it too seriously, here is the epithet with which the entry starts. I ran out of water during a hot 50 kilometers run and happened upon a petite pond near a farm. I knew the water was not drinkable, but I thought I could wash my face and head to, the, and head to cool down. I'm thinking the water had too much cow poo and pee, adding nausea to my dehydration with more than 12 miles to go. I arrived on the campus of University of Oklahoma in 1975 to pursue graduate studies. I was 21. The Pan Am flight was long with a stop at Heathrow for a beer. 
and then hovering over the endless lights of New York City, where I change airports to take a TWA to my destination. My girlfriend also joined me shortly after. She and I stayed there for one semester. Then we moved to Texas University, to a Texas university, which is now part of Texas A&M. I obtained a master's degree and began to apply to doctoral programs. However, between my doctoral programs, however, between um, the, uh, uh, my um, MS degree and the beginning of my doctoral uh, studies, something happened back where I had left my parents. There in Iran, a revolutionary movement had begun to brew. In Europe and US, uh, student organizations rallied students and public opinion against the king of Iran. Despite being suspicious of their explanations, I believed some of their lies and propaganda. I also devoured numerous books on Marxism, which were banned in Iran, but freely available on American campuses. The revolutionary movement that had started around 1976 by both the leftist and Islamist forces expanded quickly. So instead of attending my doctoral program, we returned to Tehran in February 1979, mostly out of worry about family and country. Students' organizations were also encouraging students to go back to Iran. The revolution ended the Iranian monarchy, an event that impacted lives of many in the US, the entire region, including mine. The journey back took weeks because we had to fly, ride a train, take a bus, and walk, walk to get to the border. When we crossed over the border, the day after the Shah's had, the rules had ended, no one checked our passports. Inside the country, I felt most people were hypnotized and directed to express jubilance. I could not understand why they were not worried about the prospects of religious dominance over politics and all aspects of their life. To my secular eyes, they were tricked. Why did the nation prefer Mr. Khomeini over the king or over other players? That doesn't mean I knew better. I was simply fascinated by modernity in my youth back when I dreamed of studying at Berkeley or Michigan and not so much the University of Oklahoma. Staying the country again, I realized that the Iranian Marxist individuals I met in Oklahoma and Texas must have been, must have been delusioned for teaching me things that did not match the country's reality. I was ready to listen to the elderly family members now who were warning of the danger of a new type of fascism. Yet, that I was young did not justify my decision to believe lies. In retrospect, I was, or we all were, too naive. Nevertheless, I continued to oppose the newly established religious rule. And for that, I was fired from a university uh, teaching position I had occupied, was arrested temporarily during a rally against the closure of a liberal newspaper, and was beaten up by radical vigilantes during the street rallies against mandatory bailing. My family members were also threatened with death if I did not report to a specific security office. I was forced to shut up and live a quiet life, a sort of underground and fearful life, which was even more drastic 
or dramatic with all the Iraqi bomb raids, sometimes not too far from my place. One sitting on a bus waiting to leave its terminal, an Iraqi Topolo bombed a helicopter factory across the street. I felt the bus jumping a foot into the air. Twice more, I was close to the site of air raids. Eventually, my small family and I managed to escape a secret security team that was zeroing in on my location and fleeing the country. The story of that exodus too added the deep-seated trauma I began to face since the day one of the post-revolutionary period, so-called the spring of freedom. Abroad again, I spent the next several years in two countries. In Brussels, I improved my French and received a diploma in teaching French as a second language. I found it recalled baguette and cheese on, my, on the way back home, holding on my lap, riding the super clean metro. Then I would listen to my favorite Jacques Perel song, Ce soir, j'attends Madeleine, as we ate them at our small rented house in St. Agathe, Berkham. Despite belonging to the 60s, Berel was last connection with my mixed useful social discourse. I was more fascinated by the museums, films, music, the rule of law, the French language itself, and Persian literature. Eventually, I found a teaching position on Montreal. Teaching French as a second language in a prep school. On the third day of my teaching, a staff person told me that the principal wanted to see me in his office. I entered a large room with elegant decorations and old leather furnishings, where the principal with gray hair and red chicks was sitting behind a beautiful dark brown de oak desk. Thanks to my shaky confidence and low self-esteem, I thought I was, I, he wanted to fire, to fire me. He offered me a seat and said, he had heard I was Persian. I nodded, and he began reciting Fitzgerald's translation of Khayyam's 12th century Persian poems. I sighed, and then he got up and let me know I could return to class. I stayed, I only stayed um, um, at that work uh, for a short time anyway. Small salary. In Quebec, I hiked the national parks and swam in cold lakes. Once I broke the ice in Lac du Diable in Mont Tremblant to swim. I got severe sinusitis that stayed with me for decades. In 1990s, Montreal, neither Riviere de Pererie nor the mighty Saint Laurent offered a running path at least near anywhere uh, I live. I had to run my five milers on suffocating summer days or unpredictable early spring days when there was no snow along a street that stretched uninterrupted besides a railroad. The road was quite enough to think about my past life which suddenly turned into a nightmare due to a mistake, and more painfully about the uncertain future. My mistake, my generation's mistake, was it the fault of those who sold medievalism as revolutionary discourse? What role did the Marxists, the Soviet supporters play? Wasn't the error collective? Either way, it was national horror. During one of those runs on a hazy and warm day in 1990 in Montreal, I decided to find an answer to these questions. And I thought the answers would be 
in wouldn't be in history books or political archives, but in the works of literature. I applied to a Canadian university and the University of Michigan. I chose the latter to pursue graduate studies once again. Emotionally disturbed, physically marred with seven severe illnesses, divorced and worried about how to support a young child, whom we took out of the country across the blowing waters of the Persian Gulf, I was also overwhelmed with ubiquitous thought of having lost a decade of life to a dark, devastating revolution that did not need to occur. What if I had not returned to Iran on the evening, on the eve of revolution? What about those who did not survive? What about so many students who were executed in prison? What about hundreds of thousands who were killed in the war with the neighboring country? If right now you're thinking that the events of the re recent months in 2022 are all deja vu, for me, the answer is yes and no. Everything about this ongoing revolution, however, is beautiful, natural, inspiring, and yes, fortunately feminine. The 1979 revolution, as I would explain in one of my books, Modernity, Sexuality, and Ideology, The Legacy of an Iranian Dancer, was all about masculinity in its most traditional form. The ongoing tragedies also render my experience so very insignificant. Yes, depleted financially, broken physically, and inferior emotionally, I returned to the US after more than 10 years of ambiguity and, and anguish in several separate places of the world. However, it felt different in Ann Arbor and running was different by Hero River. When I arrived on the path near the Arboretum with its mighty trees, I wanted to believe I had made the right decision to leave everything behind for the third time. I felt no regret. I even felt I could fall in love again. But here too, Twisty River, the Twisty River of Huron, my mendering memories. And only gradually, I succeeded in spending part of my daydreaming to make a connection between my experience, literature, and social change, all of which are the context of many of my publications. I was physically able to run faster and academically as stronger as to progress faster. This connection between apparent, the, the, the connection be, became uh, apparent to me in my conceptualizations of episodic literary movement model, which explained the history of contemporary Persian literature and to some extent, Arabic and Turkish literatures. In the book I published based on my dissertation entitled The Politics of Writing in Iran, A History of Modern Persian Literature. The episodic literary movements I showed as part of literary history had all been inspired and inspiring to social discourses as nationalism or what I call Persianism, Marxism, Islam, and feminism. Mentally and physically, I had interacted with all of them. Returning to my studies and taking a stab at the normal life was arduous and surviving was not easy either. I had to run literally and metaphysically, but it seemed as if I reversed time and became more fascinated and engaged with literature and culture. The only meaningful slogan for me was now long live graduate studies. In the next five years, I obtained doctoral, a doctoral degree in Near Eastern studies focusing on comparative studies of modern Persian literature and a second MA degree 
in literary theory from the programming competitive literature on the same campus. During those five years, I also studied Nizami's poetry with Professor Alan Luther, the most selfless, honest academicians I have ever met. A few students and I met in his office or in his basement when he couldn't go to campus anymore to read Nizami's poetry. Only a few of us, including one from computer science, were there each time for all five years. Alan Luther would get upset when I refused to take sugar with the Persian tea his wife had prepared for us. How do you call yourself a Persian if you're not taking sugar with your tea? Chai bedun aran? Before defending my dissertation, I received a teaching position at Princeton University, where I stayed for three of my contract, three years of my contract. Then I moved to the University of Arizona in the green desert of Sonora, where I created a robust program, an Iranian studies, um, studies program at the Department of Near Eastern Studies, now known with its more populous name, the School of Middle Eastern and North African Studies. Six years ago, with a generous grant from RCHI, I founded the Roshan Graduate Interdisciplinary Program in Persian and Iranian Studies, which I still chair. It is perhaps the first program in the nation that offers a graduate degree with that title in this field. Based on the formal descriptions, the University of Arizona's graduate interdisciplinary programs or GIDPs transcend departmental boundaries by facilitating cutting edge teaching and research where traditional disciplines interface. The fusion of ideas, techniques, and expertise for the traditional academic fields provide for the evolution of modern and imaginative methods of research and the creation of new fields of endeavor. Accordingly, I have developed several interdisciplinary courses and have worked with tens of graduate students. Thus, for an academician with mixed daydreaming trains of thoughts during his trail runnings to the top of surrounding mountains and back, the Persian GIDP is likely the most natural spot. Long before the politics of writing or my fleeting running, uh, runner's world moment of, moment of fame, I would have asked myself during my long distance runs, how should I, an academic narrative, how should an academic narrative in social sciences or the humanities be distinguished from writing about personal experience I, if I ever wanted to write about the self. When emotional trauma is part of a generation's experience, wouldn't the writing about oneself become a social hypothesis? Or is my case different from that of my generation simply because it's my experience. Pondering those questions has influenced my perceptions of running as part of a, as part of, as a sport and a social act. Today, thanks to the format of this forum, my brief life story and a, as a former activist, a current running scholar, became an academic act as well. Well, thank you for that. Uh, let us now get to the main point of, um, the main and the important point of this meeting, Persian poetry. Research and, research and publication on um, the uh, influential Nizami Ganjavi, born in uh, 1140 and died in 1202, 
And his enduring five books of narrative poetry, collectively known as Panj Ganj, Five Treasures, or Khamse Puente, <clears throat> have grown in the last four decades somewhat in a different way. However, an overwhelming majority of these works, if not all, interpret Nizami's poetry as the product or advocacy of Islamic mysticism or Islam and pay less attention to his literary techniques and his profound and complex perception of poetry, rhetoric, and eloquence. In my work, I offer five explications and argument about Nizami's poetry, often um, in comparison with um, the works of other major uh, poets to clarify the nature of um, his artistic approach um, to poetry. Um, do you see the slide with the five points? It is the running. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. And now, uh, yes. Yeah. Through these uh, theorizations and comparative analyses, um, I design a structuralist and allegorical reading of Nizami's poetry to challenge the dominant and grossly reductive mystic religious reading of the poet's work. This literary readings of Nizami's poetry will cast serious doubt on the poet's alleged mystic or religious advocacy. The last item on the slide, um, about the concept of Nizamian pictorial allegory is what connects all the points and all the chapters. Nizamian pictorial allegory is a short, that's how I um, define it, a short structured and interconnected passage with a surface story constructed using descriptions of science, religion, religious references, nature, space, man-made gardens and animals, and a second level story focused on his characters and events. The Nizamian pictorial allegory differs from a parable or fable. The surface story, in his case, might not convey a philosophical message or lesson at all. The purpose is to show or boast about the dazzling possibilities of words when juxtaposed and coordinated in terms of sound, shape, meaning. For example, the surface story in, in an Islamian um, uh, alle uh, pictorial allegory might be about a splendid garden with a night a sky filled with stars above animals within, all juxtaposed with a second story about the characters dealing with a jubilant or distressful situation. As opposed to conventional stories, the ones by Nizami do not promote any a, um, a, a, a particular external uh, ideological message either but rather serves to move his story along in an eloquent way to showcase his mastery of the language. Why is it important to challenge the notion that Nizami advocates Sufism or Islamic faith? As a reader, you might have experienced the difficulty of reading Nizami's verses in another language or even into uh, fluent Persian prose. On such occasions, many, us, many of us try to benefit from the valuable and arduous work of the commentators who have edited Nizami's books or the numerous scholars who tried to facilitate reading. 
At that moment, we might take the easy road and explain the difficulty in terms of mystic secrets or try to realize the unique inventive mind of the poet. It is the latter alternative that brings us closer, not only to the poet's meaning, but also to a state in which we can appreciate the poet's remarkable and profound rhetoric and technique, his notion of allegory. These arguments are presented in the following chapters, a couple of which are revised and expanded versions of previously published articles. In the beginning, I placed the works of Nizami Ganjali in the context of the history of classical Persian literature. I discuss Nizami sources, particularly his Rastarian books that were possibly available to him, Nizami's secularist view of the world, as well as all the existing scholarship on Nizami's work and the existing uh, editions of his Ganj. Each of the remaining chapters provide a comparative analysis of a specific theme by other poets such as Rudaki, Ferdowsi, Jami, Rumi, Hafez, Sadi, Amir Khosro, and in one rare case, Dante. In the next part entitled Nezami, the Persian world's, Worldsmith, Sahon in classical Persian poetry, I explained that Nizami's, Nizami works with various themes and motives, uh, motives in his poetry to produce sahon, discourse or eloquent speech, and that's how it was pronounced uh, at that time, which I eventually contend to mean literature. Comparing to other poets, I illust illustrate how Nezomi holds a high opinion of Sahon, particularly, particularly in its poetic form and considers poets creative artists with nearly divine status. What connects Nezomi's thematically various poems is his passion for words, literary creativity and polymathic fluency with the art of rhetoric or Sahon, which he enriches with themes and subjects such as love, religion, science, wine, philosophy, which are all renders in exclusive, uh, exclusive style with intrinsic, uh, intricate technique. The uh, poet uh, himself, uh, has shed light on uh, this uh, point. Uh, you can read uh, its English translation as I read the, the passage in... Um, in Persian. Sakhon sarsari has bare gohariyan gohari نکته نگه دار ببین چون بود نکته که سنجیده و موزون بود سنجان که سخون برکشند گنج دو عالم به سخون درکشند خاص کلیدی که در گنج راست زیر زبان مرد سخون سنج راست آن ترازوگ سخون سخته کرد بخت بران را به سخون بخته کرد بلبل عرشند سخن پروران باز چه مانند به آن دیگران Here, as you can pay attention to the, the repetition of certain sounds to the um, almost um, move from uh, one image to another um, illustrates, then the purpose is just the constrictions of an allegory, which actually starts with the, the, the descriptions of items 
um, or natural elements and then zoom in on um, the, the poet's abilities. A Sufi readings of this very passage pays attention or ten, tends to pay attention to such words such as key, um, as well as um, this and next world duality. However, Nizami is speaking on the superiority of poetic sahon over prose and provides a short comparison of the two forms, two universes, while elaborating on the specifications of sahon. Sahon is an art that can be expressed in poetic or prose form. That's what I understand from this. Can then Sahon mean literature? If Sahon with, um, uh, uh, with um, Rafie or rhyme means poetry and Rafie, San John, uh, the appraisers of rhyme means poets. And if Sahon, uh, Sahon and Mansur Mansur means prose, then what can Sahon means but literature, which can be written in the forms of poetry as well as prose. Such conceptualizations of Nizami's notion of Sahon, when combined with the notion of the Nizamian pictorial allegory, prove that his main concern was to weave poetry and not promote religiosity. The next chapter is Women and Love in the Works of Nizami, Ferdowsi, and Jami to provide a comparative um, context for the analysis of the characterizations of women. I um, studied the works of Nizami Ganjavi, Abu Ghassan Ferdowsi, and Abu Abdul Rahman Jami. They, left, uh, they lived um, approximately 200 years from each other. Three major classical Persian. Uh, poets in uh, in whose work female characters figure uh, prominently, albeit to different degrees. Specific love stories are familiar at least to at least two of these authors. Moreover, their stories include familiar characters, often based on historical figure. Finally, Nizami was inspired by, by Ferdowsi um, significantly and referred to his work why Jami was inspired by Nizami and referred to him. Perhaps for these reasons, prominent scholars of classical Persian literature, including Meisami, Burgel, and Mayad, have uh, compared some of these female characters. However, the existing literature on the topic does not provide reasons for such diverse characterizations, but merely offers engaging descriptive analysis. I explain the differences in terms of their different genres. Here, I also provide numerous examples in which Nizami is merely speaking of um, carnal, um, carnal love to prove that for him, love is not always uh, mystical. Many have, uh, many have um, argued. And, and even um, taken, take, even taking women uh, simply as signs uh, of mysticism. In uh, the story of Khosro and Shirin, at one point the king asked the nobleman to tell him where a uh, woman, um, Fuban, the good one, um, deserving his praise, can be found. Each speaker offers the name of a uh, realm and this is description of uh, women of uh, that region. Gofta letafad room darad, lots ganjasto ganj on boom darad. One said room offers beauty like jewels, and room has beautiful gems. The last person, however, suggests a beautiful girl in Sepahan, Esfahan named Shekar or sugar, and offers more details and descriptions that the previous contributor, uh, contribu contributors to, uh, to um, convince the king. It worked. Um, the passage ends with two lines, the penultimate uh, of which is uh, the last is the uh, 
the last descriptions of, of uh, Shekai. And the last line is about the, the king um, uh, establishing a new possible way of having sex with another woman. The two lines together read, Kasi kura shabi girad darahush nagardat kis paramush. Malek ra dar gereftan del nawazi asalsi known how as ishbazi. Whoever sleeps with her for one night will never forget that night. The king fell for the heart heartening words of love. He created a fresh basis for making love. Osro wants to sleep with another beautiful one, in addition to all his mistresses, to elicit Shirin's jealousy and provoke her to sleep with him. Faith, facts, and fantasy, stories of ascension and Nizami's allegory, discusses uh, Nizami's portrayal of Mehraj or the story of ascension, in which he speaks of stars, astrology, and horoscopes, like in the rest of his poetry with an intense focus. The chapter explains that the, 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 the irritations of the story alone can qualify Nizami as a religious, uh, can disqualify actually Nizami as a uh, religious advocate or uh, a, uh, a pious Muslim, or at least as a pious Muslim uh, poet, because Islam technically forbids um, uh, astrology and horoscope as um, harmful. Um, uh, several uh, books um, at his time were, were published against uh, this issue. However, through comparative a literary analysis, um, the chapter explains the literary uh, reasons for his five uh, portrayals. In fact, the relationship between um, the poets uh, and the court was um, uh, most of the time uh, complex. And um, I assume that this was part of the court politics. But um, obviously in this uh, presentation, there is no way to uh, even um, analyze one of them. But even placing all these five renditions alongside each other can tell us about the, their similar and yet complex structures. It can also show us that the poet has to spend time and care on their structures for, per, for perhaps no other reason but to, ex, to exhibit his incredible ability to work with raw materials. Wine um, and identity in the works of uh, Nezomi and Rudaki covers uh, the literary uh, representation of wine, a dominant theme in Persian poetry, giving rise to endless debate about the nature of wine and its metaphorical implications. Nezomi, like other poets, renders wine with and wine drinking throughout his work, which again could be an indication of indication that a, uh, that a conclusion about his piety is not easy. Through contextual and historical analysis and drawing on uh, the Bach, uh, Bakhtinian uh, concept of chronotope, this chapter argues that this wine is often literal and much needed for storytelling. After all, Nezomi is a pioneer in the Sorinome genre, which is a type of uh, 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 wine poetry. Uh, or poetry uh, about wine and wine drinking. These points um, to become uh, clearer uh, when Nezami's uh, portrayal of wine is um, compared to uh, a long poem by Rudaki entitled uh, The Mother of Wine, 
uh, Mother and May. Uh, chapter six, Nezomian pictorial allegory in Leilio Majnun focuses on the love story uh, between Leili and Majnun because it includes countless examples of Nezomian pictorial allegories. I further support the argument about the sophisticated aspects of Nezomi's allegorical poetry to show how Nezomi's narrative poems include a, a series of um, allegory, allegorical constructs that together um, cons um, a structure uh, to, 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 together connect the structure of his romances um, and uh, a comparison of this Lady of Ajnun also with other, uh, with um, uh, those of um, Amir Khosro Dehlavi and um, Abdurrahman Jami will also further explain Nizami's approach. Here is another example of Nizamian allegory from his story that uh, pertains to the overall argument of the book. When Majnun starts praying to by the Kabe, actually um, had been asked by his father to do that. He asked for the exact opposite of what his father um, had um, advised him to request. His first, um, he first laughs and then cries. And after that jumps towards the uh, Muslim holy uh, building like snake and curling phrase that his love for Leili intensifies and uh, uh, deepens. The father has asked him to, you know, to pray so that he would get rid of the love. It is a sublime moment again. After a descriptions of the surrounding, the segment turns into descriptions of Majnun internal, Majnun's internal feeling and thought, which partially uh, reads, Dar halqe ishq jan frusham, bi halqe u mabad gusham. Guyan ze ishq konjodayi, kinas tayr aashnayi. Mabad ze ishq mi paziram, ar mi dad ishq man bemiram. Pardi ye ishq shos sereshtam. جز عشق مبا سر نوشتم آن دلی که بود ز عشق خالی سیلا به غمش برا حالی یارب تو مرا به روی لیلی هر لحظه بده زیاده میلی از عمر من آن چه هست بر جان بستان و به عمر لیلی افزار بر چه شدم چه مویش از غم یک موی نخواهم I hope you had the chance to read the English translation as we're listening. It is an as, 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 um, astounding moment and very much unexpected. Kaabe and Mecca, the epicenter of the rise of the Islamic faith, mean different things to Majnu, um, inconsequential to his deep emotion. In the story, why neither the father nor the son gets their wishes fulfilled at that holy site, they both remain convinced in their beliefs after they return from their unsuccessful journey. The allegory builds suspense in the tragedy of those lovers. They are willing to try anything, including the greatest of all faithful acts, pilgrimage to Kaaba. In this case, the surface storyline is to seek remedy by going on the pilgrimage. The hidden, so-called hidden surface is, once again, the constructions of a sublime moment, the presentation of the surprising behavior of Majnun and his subversions of the convention, pausing on a few metaphorical constructs within this passage sheds further light on the points. 
I have been making. The lock of Lely's hair, albeit beyond the reach of Majnun, becomes a device to show how light, tightly his, this man's heart is entrapped, how his whole being is enslaved. And yet the metaphor also stands for the access point to the sacred place. In the end, for him, her beloved hair becomes his kaveh. This sequence contrasts with the Sufi beliefs. Nizami's reassignment of Majnun's Kaaba also stands in contrast to religious conventions and can be seen as almost sacrilegious. It would be too arbitrary to present this type of portrayal of Kaaba and as an ideological advocacy, and many, as um, many ideological readings do. Moreover, it would be too arbitrary, arbitrary to take Majnun's prayer for the insity of his carnal love as the Sufi step towards God, like many mystical readings do. To Majnun, Lady is a more tangible and desired destination for pilgrimage. Leili, as his eyes, in his eyes, in his, his, is his Kabe. And Nizami supports the character by making the readers understand the depth of his love, his emotion. Chapter um, on medieval masters of metaphor in search of religion and uh, uh, Dantian moments in the story of Mohan further challenges uh, <clears throat> the reading of Nizami's poetry by responding to a growing trend which is, strives to find evidence of Nizami's religiosity by comparing him to other religious authors of other traditions, this time Dante. The chapter examines more Nizami's allegory with brief references to Dante's divine comedy. It is true that even, through, even though they lived in different eras and distinct cultural settings, Nezomi, Ganjavi, and Dante Alighieri, uh, 1265 and 1331, uh, 21, share a creative imagination and eloquence. However, beyond these surface similarities, the chapter shows that these authors distinct positions in their literally messages and allegorical meanings. With that prelude, I have also connected the story of Mohan to pre-Islamic philosophical notions while providing examples of further pictorial allegories. In addition to all that, I have explained the nature and, and the purpose of the central scenes. All the natural metaphors renders to portray the garden, sandal tree, the various fruits, and the wine um, uh, reap pear in this short uh, uh, narrative uh, in different forms and combinations to picture a central and suggestive scenes of lovemaking, albeit of a Faustian nature. This tale seemed to have satisfied King Bahram's creative craving for an erotic story, which he asked of the princess in that uh, pavilion. It also shows Nizami's desire to produce more and more pictorial allegories. Finally, Sublime métier, literally technique and alleg allegory in, is the conclusion of the book, focusing on Nizami's overall literary endeavor and his literary techniques. By um, elucidating Nizami's system of ethics in terms of the situation he sets off in his um, highly allegorical works, I contend that even Nizami's ethics and indeed his morality 
are not derived from any meta-ethical notion. I explain how and why in his portrayal of characters and concepts, he relies overwhelmingly on allegories, tamsil, that are short on comparison techniques, tashbi, and metonymy, badi, degargui, and sometimes he redesignates them as well. This chart uh, might summarize what I have discovered to be Nizami's methods of coining metaphors by combining uh, nouns and adjectives and all in serving of his allegorical uh, construct. That is, the natural element of the earth Space, stars, garden, and nature in general, as tropes and met uh, metonymy, compositely and intensely cohabit in rhyming, uh, rhythmic verse or a passage to influence, foretell elucidate the expressions of the literal and tangible mental or physical status of characters or events to produce a pictorial allegory, which is on the right side of the chart. Again, an Nizamian, um, an Nizamian pictorial allegory then consists of a short unit of tightly interconnected in terms of meaning, goal, tone, sound, shape, attitude, and its external surface of verses. And it usually consists of four to 14 lines. It is a story within a story, a poem within a poem, or an image within an image. It, it, its uh, interpretation might be challenging, not because it does or does not contain an intrinsic meaning or a philosophical message, but rather because its semiotic references might be from a variety of texts, sciences, or religious uh, or religions, religions requiring intertextual approach or even an interdisciplinary reading of the piece. Thus, I conclude that this metier, um, his metier as a um, Sohan writer and romancer and his allegorical technique explain not only his style of creativity, but also his ethics and advocacy. Thank you so very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Cameron. I, I saw uh, saw some people class uh, class print. We couldn't hear them, but we could, we could see see them. And uh, <clears throat> yes, I will I I, I will switch over the camera, uh, but. Um, the recording uh, in in a minute, and uh, and open the floor for for questions. So, so if you have questions, please raise your hand uh, uh, digitally or or manually. And as I, if if your camera is on, um, yes. So so well, I wanted I wanted to thank you both both for the introduction and and the talk. It's it was it was. Uh, Quite stark contrast between the two, and it was it was nice to to have them in 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 a flowing way together. Thank you, thank you very much. Regarding to your own own personality, can you actually hear me? Uh, re regarding to to your your uh, personal history, I'm very grateful for sharing that with us. And 
And I, I wanted to tell you that several Iranian scholars in, in these months couldn't, couldn't accept simply invitations because they were so concerned about what's happening at home. Uh, and, and I also invited some, some Iranian scholars who are in Iran and they couldn't, they couldn't physically or virtually join us into the much less because because the internet being being uh, uh, more or less shut down so yes well thank thank you thank you for this um yeah thank you so i I'll, I'll switch off the the recording and and uh, please please have your questions